This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. On the local news roundup, we know what's happening on the field. Not much. But we don't know what the Panthers may be doing off the field. Could be a lot. Is a move afoot? Republicans call for a new election in the 9th Congressional District. Will that happen? And will Robert Pittenger be the Republican candidate? When CMS closed because of snow this week, they tried something new and praise and criticism ensued. And we don't know whether you felt it or not, but Charlotte, we think, <laughs> experienced an earthquake this week. That's not a metaphor. We experienced a real earthquake. Our roundtable of reporters is ready to detail those stories and others, and those reporters include David Borax from WFAE News. Good morning, Good morning. Mike. And Doss Helms is here from the Charlotte Observer. Welcome to you. Good to be here. Mary C. Curtis is a columnist for RollCall.com and a contributor to WCCB-TV. Hello. Good morning. And Nick Oxner is here. He's with WBTV News, so obviously he is on your side. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always, of course. We're, we've all gathered at the 7th Street Market in Uptown Charlotte, and if you're in the neighborhood today on the Friday morning broadcast, feel free to drop by, have some coffee, eat whatever, and sit quietly and be part of the, the program here. Let's begin with something that happened here and elsewhere around the country just yesterday. A dozen cities, I think, experienced this. Multiple bomb threats. They, these came in as bogus uh, or bogus robo emails to various uh, entities. What was the thrust of this? What, what was going on yesterday? Well, they were asking, they said that um, a device, a bomb has been planted in your building and we have an associate staking this out and you, if you transfer $20,000 in Bitcoin to this account, then it will be removed and otherwise this bomb is going to go off. Um, and it even the one that I saw online had a, a PS that said basically, we're not a terrorist organization, so don't link this to other bomb threats. In, in other words, don't look out the window and see all the other uptown Charlotte buildings that are also evacuating. And this was happening simultaneously around the country, right? That's Our right. country and I think a few other countries. Because we, we had a bomb, tra a, a bomb threat also in Watauga County, three in York County, I think one in the town of York, two in Fort Mill, Another in Monroe, the Raleigh News and Observer was evacuated. Uh, also bomb threats in Virginia, New York, Iowa, Nevada, Michigan, and Idaho. No idea. No Who's idea. Behind this? Pretty early on yesterday, the New York City Police Department put out an announcement saying that they had investigated and there was no credible threat here. How do they but know that? that? Uh, they, they checked out what they, the, the threats that came in and they looked into it and they couldn't find anything there. Okay. I think the real question is, is this an inept attempt to make some money? You know, yeah. is there some guy in Oklahoma who's going to have the FBI knocking on his door in the next few days? Or is this part of the whole sort of cyber warfare distraction? You know, is there basically a troll farm in Russia that found a good way to disrupt a lot of activities And here? that's the crazy thing, because look how effective it was. I mean, things stopped, and this became a big headline very quickly all across the country. Yeah. And so this could be a new evolution of how we so... I'll be cynical and say, I, I wonder if this is what you do with your new Bitcoin account. <laughs> in, initially, it, it appeared as though they were evacuating office buildings in Charlotte, but it, I don't know whether they, did, whether, they did, whether they did that or not. They evacuated the view on North Pine Street. That's a 50-story apartment complex. The catalyst on uh, West Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Boulevard. Uh, were they actually threatened or was that out of, uh, 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 out of caution? Do we know? We don't know. I assume they got threats. Yeah. I also heard that it was a number of media outlets around the country that got them, which the Charlotte Observer did not, although CNN reported that we did. But um, that was some confusion between Raleigh and Charlotte. Yeah. And the CMPD lieutenant was clear that what was happening is people were getting emails with these threats at businesses or buildings, wherever, and then calling 911 to report those threats. And right. so it was a little bit of a delayed chain as people opened their emails when they decided when, right. you know, they... How long did this go on yesterday? How long were buildings, people standing on the street waiting to get back inside? We don't know. From what I saw, it was a couple hours in the afternoon was kind okay. of when everything was landing. So this is obviously a, although it happened in jurisdictions all over the country, this is a federal crime. Absolutely. The FBI was tweeting about it yesterday, said they're providing support to local agencies across the country. Certainly one, you could say, could be a federal crime. Um, dozens or hundreds, definitely a federal crime. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess this is a story that will unfold over the next several weeks as we go through it here. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we played a cut on this show, thanks to uh, WRHI and Rock Hill. 
They were there at a meeting of the uh, York County Chamber of Commerce at which uh, Panthers play-by-play -play announcer Mick Mixon threw out a tantalizing idea to people in York County. He said something along the lines of, what if I told you that the Panthers were going to open up a large training, I'm paraphrasing here, a large training facility in your backyard. Well, that was news to everybody in the room, including York County officials. And now the Charleston Post and Courier has reported that the Panthers are in fact planning to build a team headquarters building and practice facility in York County. This would mean the loss of about 300 jobs in Charlotte. And I asked Charlotte Mayor Vi Lyles if she thought this was the first indication, I did this yesterday, uh, if this was the first indication that new Panthers owner David Tepper might be moving toward asking for a new stadium. I don't read anything into this except a newspaper story that came out that has a lot of maybes and might bes. So, what, if anything, do we know about this? One thing we know is that when David Tepper came to town and took over as owner this summer, he did talk about uh, one of his goals was to look at their practice facilities and consider whether to move them or not. That was kind of wrapped up in the conversation about a new stadium and moving to South Carolina and that sort of thing. But at that time, it was you know something that we didn't, th there was no details. This uh, comments by Mick Mixon a couple weeks ago was the first time that we heard any movement on this. Obviously, a lot of people in, in Charlotte are worried about this because it does mean jobs and it does kind of signal that the, the owner of the team is looking somewhere else. But he's also made some statements that are pretty strongly committed to Bank of America Stadium here in Charlotte. Well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, there's a big difference between having a, a new stadium and a new practice facility. The Panthers are some, one of the only NFL teams in the country that don't have a separate indoor practice facility. You know, if you look, most teams have that facility that's where their offices are, and uh, the Panthers practice in an open field kind of essentially behind the stadium. And so we know, I mean, Tepper's made it pretty clear since he's bought the team, his priority is getting a new practice facility, indoor practice facility and offices. That is separate and apart from a stadium. And I think if you're him and you have a team that claims a fan base in both states, it actually makes pretty good sense to have facilities. Yeah, in but, but think about this. You move the headquarters and 300 jobs to Fort Mill. You, you put the practice facility there. That means that the Panthers will spend eight days a year in Charlotte. Panthers only, and 75,000 of their closest friends. Yes, but there are only eight games. There are only eight home games. That's eight days a year in Charlotte makes it really, really easy to ask for a new stadium over moving the whole operation. You know, that's always been true since the franchise came here. There was always going to be a limited number of dates. I want to remind you that one of the other things David Tepter talk about, talked about this summer was wanting to get more events in the stadium. And he talked about everything from high school and college games to uh, maybe professional soccer games, all that sort of thing. So he's trying to get the, the stadium more active. The Panthers still will only have eight or, or nine games a year there, but yeah. So I'm sitting here with all these news reporters and none of you are skeptics. None of you are cynics. What the heck is wrong with you people? <laughs> <laughs> I've saved my skepticism for a lot of other things this week, Craig. And from the beginning, they've always tried to say that it was the team of the Carolinas. Yes. So practically, it hasn't really worked out that way in some sense. Well, you do think of them as right. Charlotte-based, obviously. So, all right, let me take the bait. <laughs> there are other teams yeah. around the NFL that have decided to leave the center city area and move to new facilities in the suburbs. That's absolutely a possibility here. Uh, across the border in South Carolina, off of I-485, would be a prime location. Uh, but that's going to take a lot of money to build a new stadium. And another that may just be a way for the Panthers to look at getting upgrades to their current stadium. And that's something that Tepper has also said is a possibility. Well, we're doing this from uh, the 7th Street Market. I'm just interested in hearing what people sitting out here might think. Is this a ploy? Is this the shot over the bow to ask for uh, uh, more money for stadium improvements or maybe a new stadium uh, down the road? Or is this just what it appears to be a trial balloon to maybe move some things to South Carolina? How many of you think it's a, it's a shot across the bow? Let's hear applause. How many of you think this is just a way to spread the wealth. 
Well, optimists. Yeah. We have optimists in our midst out here. Here's a question. I know this initially started with Mick Mixon, who was an insider and maybe was, was doing his own trial balloon or just maybe a slip of the tongue on his part when he released that information to York County. But why is this story coming from the Charleston News and Courier? Why? Or well, Post and Courier. Why isn't it coming from you guys at The Observer? Well, I will note that it was from Andy Shane, who is a former Observer reporter. <laughs> uh, and it sounds like there may be some South Carolina political connections to this. There was some reference made to Tepper being um, an honorary co-chair of Governor Henry McMaster's inaugural committee. So I wonder if some of this is bubbling through the South Carolina political establishment. It's the local news roundup on Charlotte Talks on WFAE. It, it continues to surprise me that nobody in York County seems to know or claims to know anything about this. Surely, if this is really going on, somebody has had some conversation somewhere. Hasn't the local economic development uh, organization, hasn't their line basically been, we can't talk about it, we don't have a comment, which yeah. basically is a pretty good indicator of we've got a big fish on the line, don't screw this up for us. Yeah. You think that's what it is? Oh, I think even if it doesn't end up happening, I think you've certainly been exploring it and clearly pretty seriously. It's interesting, when, when we talked about Mixon's clip on the show the other week, we, the question then was, was this a, a slip of the tongue or was this a purposeful plant? Right. It's looking more and more like a purposeful plant. Uh, he's certainly sending signals that this is going to happen to test the, to test the waves. But again, I want to go back to this thing about, is this a, a shot of the bows? I, I think we would know. I think if your plan was to, for lack of a better term, uh, twist the arm or extort some you know, public financing of a new stadium or renovation, I think you'd be a little more explicit in that at this point. But he's been very clear he wants a new facility, and I, I yeah. think it just makes good sense. And th oh. there, is, uh, there are sites down in the Fort Mill area that would make sense for the Panthers. Uh, the Knight Stadium is one of the places being talked about. Um, we haven't heard any alternatives for where else it might go at this point. So. Uh, I think it's safe to say that the Panthers are looking at this. What would the economic impact of this be to Charlotte? I mean, it, 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 there are 300 jobs involved. Not everybody's going to just move across the border to, because they're going to have to travel 30 more minutes to get to work, but some of them will. And certainly the, the, the payroll tax dollars may go from North to South Carolina. Uh, what, what, what about other kinds of, in, uh, of revenues that come in from the physical plant actually being here? You know, the biggest impact that the Panthers make here is their games on those eight or nine Sundays a year. Uh, they are also going to be looking at ways to pump that up, uh, maybe acquiring some more parking, uh, do, doing renovations on the stadium that get more costly executive suites, that sort of thing. Um, I think the biggest impact is there and not with the practice facility. So do you think this, if this actually comes to be, will the city, do you think, bid on something to convince them to stay? I don't, I, I'm, I'm with David here. So in, it, what, Tepper said two things. One, we need a new practice facility. We're going to build that. But two, he wants to use the venue more. And so I think whatever revenue we might lose from that moving will gain by him holding more events at the stadium. Okay, well, we'll see what happens with that as well. It, when we come back, there's something going on in the 9th Congressional District. Have you heard about this? <laughs> no. <laughs> huh? <laughs> and the Republican Party in North Carolina has asked for a new election. The question is, who will run? We'll find that out, and we'll talk about that when we come back. It's Charlotte Talks from 7th Street Market on WFAE. <laughs>
In the new movie, Mary Poppins Returns, Lin-Manuel Miranda plays Jack, a lamplighter. He sees the light in any situation. He looks for the bright side, the hope, even in a dark time or in a dark place. It's a far cry from the role of Alexander Hamilton that made Miranda a household name. That plus the week in politics, this afternoon on All Things Considered from NPR News. Join us today at 4 on 90.7 WFAE, Charlotte's NPR News Source. It's Charlotte Talks on listener-funded 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. It's the local news roundup. We do this every Friday, normally from our studio. But today, because it's raining and we got to walk here, uh, we're at 7... <laughs> but with your really weird umbrella. That's right. <laughs> 7th Street Market is where we are. And if you're in the neighborhood, stop by and join us in this little ring-dang-do. We are here with uh, Mary C. Curtis from Roll Call and WCCB, Nick Oxter from WBTV News, and Doss Helms from the Charlotte Observer, and our own David Borax. The uh, troubles emanating from Bladen County over the 9th Congressional District have gotten worse and worse and worse to the point where this week, in an extraordinary move, the state Republican Party called for a new election. Dallas Woodhouse is the executive director of that party. He called it a dark day and bemoaned the fact that many people would simply ignore this new election and not vote, but that a new election had to be held. The most important thing is that people in the 9th Congressional District have confidence that the person that represents them in Washington is there with the support of the voters. Now this was prompted by the revelation that elections workers in Bladen County had prematurely counted absentee ballots prior to election day and worse, they let outsiders, they were unspecific about who those people were, but outsiders saw them count this and this could have led to some sort of unfair advantage getting people to go to the polls or fill out their ballots prior to election day. Allegations of ballot harvesting, also illegal, have been floating around for weeks, but it was this infraction, this early count, that caused the Republican Party to say, we want a new election. Why? What, why is that worse? Mary. Well, well, it's been really interesting to see how they have moved their position, the, the state Republican Party, from saying you must certify these votes uh, or you should certify the election for Mark Harris even while you are investigating it to saying now you have to you have to uh, have a new election uh, in the ninth district yes all of these things have been illegal and you've also seen them move away from Mark Harris the candidate from saying you have to certify him to now going through pains to perhaps saying that he shouldn't even be the one to run in the district against Dan McCready. Yeah, Politico reported yesterday that uh, North Carolina Republicans are, this is a quote, are readying an escape plan from Republican Mark Harris's scandal-plagued campaign. Is well, that a fair quote? Is it scandal-plagued? Well, really? definitely. Now they have a lot of proof. They have photos of him with this elections worker, El McCray, Dallas, and as well as their reporting in the Washington Post that Mark Harris actually directed the company to hire this guy who's pretty sketchy. He's an ex-felon, uh, and he had been implicated in scandals before in Bladen County. So you see them backing away from Mark Harris. Yeah, the Post says, uh, the Washington Post says, North Carolina congressional candidate Mark Harris directed the hiring of a campaign aide now at the center of the election fraud investigation, according to three individuals familiar with the campaign, despite warnings that the operative may have used questionable tactics to deliver votes. That says Mark knew he was a scumbag? Well, <laughs> it was no secret that this guy had problems. Also, you see that it goes back to the primary uh, against the incumbent, Robert Pittenger, and there's, of course, intimations that there were irregularities in that campaign as well. So Pittenger actually is pretty upset as well, I would think. So where's the state Democratic Party on all of this? I haven't heard a peep out of them. Well, They're just they, laying low because it's not their problem. No, they, they <laughs> held a press conference. Uh, is today Friday? So that press conference was Tuesday, I think, right. uh, in Raleigh. The, the state party chairman, Wayne Goodwin, uh, held a press conference, and, and uh, they specifically, him and, and State Senator Floyd McKissick, and they specifically started referring to this as Republican voter fraud. That's the term that they use. Um, 
this this press conference about an hour after I broke the news that Whitehouse said that there should be a new. Actually, that to... explains uh, partly why I think the Republicans are fo focusing on this early voting piece, which is that's a, a problem with the elections board there. Uh, we don't know enough about this yet to know if it was directed from one side or the other, but if they can point the finger at the elections board, it steers attention away from any improprieties done by party workers. And I think where Democrats and Republicans are now, as a new election looks increasingly likely, is starting to think about money, because this was a very expensive campaign and a lot of money has already been spent. We all remember seeing countless ads about this. So Democrats are starting to send out, you know, fundraising for Dan McCready, who, you know, spent most of his money. Robert Pittenger spent most of his money. I, I actually already heard an ad in my earpiece on WBTV, I mean, about this race already, <laughs> calling for a new election. But here's the other thing. Um, Democrats are linked to a group that had an absentee ballot operation as well. Yes, the North Car uh, the uh, Bladen County Improvement Association PAC. Yes. Aside from making sure that the streets are clean and the grass is cut evenly, what do these people do? <laughs> well, their official mission is, uh, at least in elections, they say, is to help um, minority voters vote, and specifically elderly minority voters, to make sure that, that they are not disenfranchised. Um, however, we have uh, uncovered evidence in terms of campaign finance reports, in terms of ballot documents, and in terms of on-camera interviews, where we know two people paid by that PAC, uh, one witnessed, 110 ballots, that in of itself is not illegal, but then we went and talked to two voters who had their ballot witnessed by employees of the PAC, and they said two things. One, that they finished their ballot and handed it to the PAC employee. The state board has taken a position to date that that is illegal to take possession of someone's ballot. There's some debate about that, but the state board says you can't do it. And secondly, and maybe more uh, importantly or seriously, we know that in talking to the voters, the two voters I talked with, only one woman paid by the PAC witness, actually witnessed the ballot, but there are two witness signatures which is required on an absentee ballot. And, and how does this connect to the Democratic Party? So the Democratic Party has paid them more than $21,000 since 2010, and in the 2018 election, in the month leading up to the election, the Democratic Party paid the PAC $6,000, uh, a large majority of the funding in this election. So Wayne Goodwin, though, has denied any knowledge of activities taken by these two men paid by the PAC, right? So they ignored our re – we first started reporting on this last week, and they ignored our request. We went to his press conference and asked him questions. At uh, first he said he was just hearing about this then. That's not true. He'd heard about it a week earlier. Our spokesman clarified he was only hearing about a third allegation that a man whose ballot was also witnessed by the PAC told Politico uh, that they've just – voted his ballot, fill out his ballot for him. Um, he, when I asked him, he wouldn't give me a real direct head-on response, only saying that uh, he's not an investigator and this needs to be investigated. State Republicans appear to have taken the lead on this. They appear to be way out front on this. Uh, they, they're the ones that called for the new election. Uh, Dallas Woodhouse uh, did this uh, press conference earlier this week in which he uh, beat his chest and, and, and talked about how awful this was for everybody involved, and it truly is. And he's made the rounds of national television shows uh, proclaiming that this is a travesty and, and, and an, uh, an affront to the voters of North Carolina and it needs to be corrected. And he and uh, the party chair, Robin Hayes, have both praised, this is something odd coming from Republicans, they have both praised the media, particularly in Charlotte, for their coverage of this story. Explain all this. Well, and, and so here's a weird thing, too. We know about the question surrounding the, at, the, the early vote tabulation because of an affidavit gathered and submitted by the state Democratic Party. And so the Republicans used some information gathered by the Democrats to call for a new election. Uh, picking up on Mary's point, it is certainly interesting that, you know, three weeks ago when this race wasn't certified initially, I sat in Dallas Woodhouse's dining room and he said, Mark Harris is the congressman and rightfully elected. And I, I think there is a recognition now, at least by the party, that this is more serious and this well, isn't you know, in this and, there's, and there's certain irony, too, because this is up against the backdrop of the relentless pursuit of a voter ID bill by uh, particularly state Republicans. And even though we've had past voter bills thrown out, 
uh, that were initiated after the Supreme Court gutted some key provisions of the Voting Out Rights Act, and the federal appeals court said no, they go after minority voters with almost surgical precision. Now we had it in the ballot, in the midterms, and they're coming up with another one. So there's the irony after talking about voter fraud, voter fraud because of IDs, well, is this it, election is fraud. It, is, it ir is it irony? Uh, we, yeah. we've, gotten a couple, we've talked about this several times in the last two weeks, and, and we've gotten emails from listeners saying uh, uh, perhaps this might be a diversionary tactic. Look over here at all yeah. this voter fraud, people trying to vote fraudulently when actually over here they know all this other stuff this skullduggery is going on that they are maybe partly responsible for. Well, you can't say that how much folks know yet, although obviously the signs were there going back years and in investigations, but it is true that all the studies show that ID fraud, folks showing up and voting as None someone else, is virtually non-existent, right. and that they went after the different IDs that are really used predominantly by minorities, the young, the elderly. So we do see that have, has happened. David. Mike, back to your point about this. Uh, I think the Republicans did quite successfully seize the, the lead on this with the announcement on Tuesday. Um, I do think when this is studied in Political Communications 101, you know, that will be looked at as a masterful move by the Republicans to try and get out in front of this. Mm -hmm. I, it actually was seizing it from the Democrats, though. Remember, this originally all came up because the chairman of the state board of elections said there's bad stuff happening in bladen county and we need to look into this and that the democrats had the momentum there he actually resigned after that because of some other issues that kind of put him in the spotlight instead of these allegations but the democrats seem to have the momentum there and then the republicans have seized it back again and there does seem to be some strategy too to coming back and saying this is so awful that we need to start over with a new primary because yeah. You know, the McCready-Harris race was very close to start with, right. and Harris is damaged, however much he knew or didn't know. So they went from, we think Harris should get it, to, you know, if it goes back to those two, we may be in trouble, so let's open this back up, see who else might be the Republican nominee. And there is a lot of angst about that from some of the grassroots Republican activists, volunteers, local folks in the 9th Congressional District who feel like Dallas and, and uh, Woodhouse and Robin Hayes and the party have kind of thrown Mark Harris under the bus, and I think we're going to hear a lot more bubbling up about that in the days to come. The other interesting point that David just made is that it was actually Joshua Malcolm who said there are a lot of bad things going on in Bladen and Robinson County, who at the time was the vice chair when this started. Vice chair. After, after uh, the resignation of the chairman, Andy Penry, he is now driving the bus. He is now the chairman. And so we've actually, I think that is a not a bad shift, but a shift in the narrative because you have the guy who really got his colleagues on the board to unanimously agree that this is a thing that needs to be looked well, we, into well, now steering the ship. And the election board itself is odd because now with the it might change because of the amendment on the Constitution uh, that says now it, you know, they threw that out. People did not vote for it. We don't know yet exactly where this is going in terms of a new election, although uh, Republican State Senator uh, Dan Bishop has called for one, and he says that the State Board of Elections should call for one with an entirely new election cycle. That means a new primary. The State Board of Elections is going to meet sometime between now and the 21st of December, maybe, to decide that? So that is what they have voted on the last time the board met. They voted to have an evidentiary hearing by December 21st. That being okay. said, Joshua Malcolm, who's now the State Board Chairman, has indicated twice in letters to the three-judge panel overseeing the lawsuit about the makeup of the State Board. Uh -huh that they may not be ready to have that evidentiary hearing by the 21st. They're still out gathering evidence. And so while it's currently set to be had by the 21st, I wouldn't be surprised if that is delayed. They could be swearing in Congress before this is decided. Oh, I, I think, I think that you would be confident in that. Um, Nancy Pelosi has said, you know, it's up to them who they are going to seat or right. not in the U.S. Congress. So uh, this opens it up possibly to a new primary, and that would mean that Robert Pittenger could run again? Or, or would it just be a Republican primary, or would it be both the Republican and the Democratic primary? Well, we know so that the guy who ran against the Dan McCready can't run because he is now supporting a libertarian, and the Democrats have disqualified him as being a Democrat. So and that the only, up until um, 
two days ago, the only way we could have a new primary is if Congress ordered one, because the state board certified those primary results. They didn't have the ability to order a new primary race. While in this new, in the new bill passed by the General Assembly this week, uh, changing the way the state board is made up in response to that lawsuit that is being overseen by the three-judge panel, try to keep track. There's so many things happening with the state board right now. Um, in this new legislation dictating how the board would be made up, they also included a provision that was included in draft one, taken out by the Senate in draft two, added back in by the Senate in draft three that got passed. There now can be a primary. So as our heads explode here, <laughs> let's just take a breather so I can say it. Charlotte talks on WFAE. Uh, if there is a new primary, the field of candidates widens to, to anybody in this room, it seems to me. Yeah, do you want to be the congressman? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, Pat McCrory, though, used his radio program, which is opposite ours, by the way, in case you want to listen. Uh, Pat McCrory <laughs> has said no. He doesn't want this. Why? Who would? <laughs> <laughs> what has Robert Pittenger said? He's been uh, very quiet. Yes. I, I would be... I think it would be a natural assumption that if there was a new primary, he would want to run. There are also some other names floating around out there. Well, among them Matthew Reidenhauer, who recently lost his seat on the county commission as a Republican, and he said he would wait to hear what Robert Pittenger's, is that right, Robert Pittenger's intentions were, not Mark Harris's? Well, that would make sense. I mean, I guess at this point, Pittenger's still the incumbent-ish. To the extent we have an incumbent, yeah. and uh, and so if you're a, a guy like Ridenauer, that's what you would want to do. So and again, you're looking about needing to raise money for a, a pretty significant race. He probably does not want to be pitted against somebody who's already been in this. But if essentially, if Mark Harris is damaged and Robert Pittenger doesn't step in, you have Matthew Ridenauer, who is interestingly a Marine veteran and. Dan McCready's campaign, as, as we Marines. heard last week when he came on the air, right. was, did I tell you that I'm a Marine? I'm a Marine. I've been, I'm a veteran. Many and, times. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Tim on Twitter says, what about the McCray connection to Todd Johnson in the past Republican primary? Johnson's now slated to be a Union County Board of, uh, Union County, Board of County Commissioners uh, member. Do anybody know about that? Well, so uh, McCray Dallas did not work for Mark Harris in 2016. Uh, he worked for Todd Johnson, and Todd Johnson collected like 240, more than 200, yeah. 200 and something uh, absentee ballots uh, in Bladen County in the primary in 2016. Uh, even though he came in third place overall, he did very well with absentee ballots. And had Mark Harris had that percentage, he would have beat Robert Pittenger likely because the, the margin was so thin. And... Um, so according to the Washington Post reporting last night, it was after that that Harris said, well, how did this happen and who did it? And let me get him on my team. And, and uh, um, I can't think of his name now. Uh, the uh, Republican Party guy uh, who had Dallas the press Woodhouse. conference. Okay. Dallas Woodhouse. Thank you. Jeez. He said essentially this week that all they know about Mark Harris is that he's a minister and he's a good guy. That's all they know about him. How can that be? He's run three times. I think he's... In the conversations that I've had with Dallas Woodhouse about this, he said this is just what he knows him to be, you know, his character. We're going to come back and talk a little bit more about this on the other side of the break. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE from 7th Street Market. Appreciate it because he's, he's the one. 
I know. I know. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're healthy, we're fresh, we're local. I know that because there's signs up here at 7th Street Market that tell me that. That's why we're here. That we want to be healthy, fresh, and local. Mary, Mary C. Curtis is here, a reporter or a columnist, rather, for Roll Call, and Doss Helms, an education reporter for the Charlotte Observer. David Borax from WFAE News and Nick Oxner with WBTV News. Just a couple of little ending comments about this ninth district debacle you can get out of this with just a couple uh, yeah well i've been talking about it for two and a half weeks now so uh, a man named mccray dallas of course is at the center of allegations of voter fraud involving the collection of absentee ballots which seems to have taken a back seat now to other infractions uh, he was hired by a company called red dome group who were in turn hired by the mark harris campaign you spoke nick I think this week, with a woman named Lisa Britt, one of Dallas's workers, who has been singled out in affidavits as having collected absentee ballots and filling them in. I haven't committed any crimes. Did you ever take someone's ballot from them? No, sir. Did you ever change someone's ballot? No, no, sir. Did you ever witness a ballot that you didn't actually see cast? No, sir. So you asked her what she did do. We basically went to areas of people who do not have a vehicle and would not actually be able to make it to the polls to vote so that way they would have the option to vote because we wanted to make it so everyone actually had an option to vote well now that sounds on the up and up is it <laughs> if what if that is what they did then yes and, and that's the same thing that the blade and improvement association says they did and that everyone it is important Getting lost in this bigger picture, and I grew up in Hope Mills, North Carolina, which is in the corner of Cum uh, Cumberland County that borders Bladen and Robinson, okay. where this is going on. So pretty close to here. And it is important to have the perspective that in some form, absentee ballot operations like this have been going on in Bladen and Robinson and Columbus counties for a very long time. Why? Why there? Because this is how they do. And clearly, Why? And clearly it's effective. Okay. You can't argue with this efficacy, right, and legal or not. And, and so a couple things. One, I think it's going to come down to at least some of the people involved in this on all sides say, we've been doing this for years, people have investigated before, it's never, we've never been told to stop doing it. Uh, people have said we asked the board for guidance, they said this is okay. And so I think at least to some people, and maybe in part at least to Lisa Britt when we talked to her on uh, Wednesday evening, I think that is really how they believe they're doing. They're just going out. Of course, they're helping people vote, but they're also helping their candidate. Um, the question of possible infractions or you know illegal activity comes in the ways by which you do it. The state board says you can't take custody of someone's ballot. Uh, can you? Can you put it in the mail? Did they do that? What have you? Uh, you know, you have to have two witness signatures on your absentee ballot cover verifying or authenticating that you, you the voter, cast the ballot. Uh, did both the people who witnessed the ballot actually witness it? You know, that's a question that is for all sides here. Um, and those things could be felonies if you, if you didn't do them right. Hmm. Um, of course, there have also been bigger allegations that Lisa Britt specifically, in suggestions, but no real evidence, that Lisa Britt took people's ballots and they didn't end up getting cast. We've not seen hard documented proof of that yet. She denies it. Um, and I guess we'll have to wait for the larger investigation to, to unfold. And they've looked at the numbers and they are outliers, uh, Bladen and Robson County, and the amount of ballots that were requested and the amount returned. So it do does look that either a whole lot of people didn't return them or something happened to those ballots. There's just so many questions. And once again, North Carolina in the spotlight over yes. voting. Could that be why Apple doesn't want to come here? <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, that's a topic for another day. <laughs> Let's move on to the weather because uh, we, although it's raining today, it snowed earlier and last week, it snowed last weekend, and that caused schools to close, obviously. But this time when it came to time to decide when to open, 
Clayton Wilcox, the superintendent of schools, decided to open some, but not others. And people seemed to like that, but people also seemed to didn't like that. So what's, what's the story, Anne? So, of course, the context here is that this is coming in an unusual year in which large chunks of North Carolina um, have seen two hurricanes that led to closings and then an early winter storm. So they'd already lost a lot of days. Uh, their makeup options were dwindling. And the, the story here and in Wake County as well has always been this is a countywide district. We have magnet schools. People are not neatly tied to geographic areas. So if part of the county has to close, the whole county closes. And on Sunday, I believe it was, as they were preparing, Wake County actually sent out a very long Twitter defense of this system. And that was how Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools did it on Monday. And, or I guess, on, and then on Monday afternoon, they sent out an announcement saying, everybody's gonna go back, but on a two hour delay. And apparently in the intervening hours, they were getting an awful lot of <clears throat> emails, pictures, social media sharings of people in the North saying, this is not gonna be safe, we're still icy. And so they went from saying, you know, it's gonna take a lot of thought and study to figure out how to do this with different strategies for different parts of the county to saying at 9.30 on Monday night, you know what, we're gonna do it. And 35, 35 schools are gonna actually close and the rest are gonna go back so, on a so two hour delay. To, what does that do to the calendar that is already screwed up because of all these other days off? Well, if we get absolutely no more closings, which would be um, extremely lucky, yeah. all right, they, Dr. Wilcox had already said, we're not gonna take the two designated days at the beginning and end of winter break. And this was before the snowstorm, but he said, go ahead and make your plans. We're not gonna take those. But so the next three days that are available are one in January, one in February, one in March. Those are, th there will be the Martin Luther King holiday. And now because some schools will go back on January 22nd and some will not because of this split decision for the snow. But for, basically from that long weekend until spring break in April, there's no break now. Everybody's coming back every day of the week. And he's gotten praise and criticism for that as well, right? Well, I don't think he really had a lot of options there. I think right. it's been the, the decision to change course quickly and respond to conditions. And this is really emblematic of what people do or don't like about Dr. Wilcox. There are people who say he responds almost impulsively to conditions without consulting all of the staff who actually need to make things happen and that yep. that can be problematic. But there are also people who say, but what they've always done in the past is need to convene a study group and make sure it works for all the adults who are entrenched in doing things. And he just responded to conditions and did what was right for kids. So moving up the road to Chapel Hill, we talked last week about uh, the silent Sam controversy, the Board of Governors voting to spend five point, I think, three million dollars to construct a standalone building so they could put silent Sam in the building and contextualize the statue. Uh, this week, the school student body president announced student government opposition to that, and evidently the graduate assistants en masse have said they will hold student grades hostage because they don't agree with this decision. How can they do that? Well, I think this is essentially an act of civil disobedience. This is ratcheting things up to a whole different level, and one would assume that they are going to be putting their jobs and their academic careers on the line if they actually go through with this. But they're saying, this is so wrong that we are going to take this dramatic action that will affect all sorts of undergraduate students unless you drop this plan to build the, what some people are calling a memorial to Silent Sam what and get there, him off is campus. Is there objection spending the money on the building so that they can put the, st the statue in the building and contextualize the statue or what? What's yeah, their objection? I mean, spending $5 million to house a statue no one likes and wants on campus right. is not the best way to handle this. Okay. Thing, so. And the state law on that is so it's specific and vague. It says you can't move them to a museum and it has to have its own place, but it has to be the same place. And they're just really rebelling against it. For so many people, they just want it to go away. Right. Closer to home, uh, after a year on probation, Johnson C. Smith University was uh, re-accredited, fully accredited again this week. Why, remind us why they were on probation in the first place and what they did to get off. Uh, Johnson C. Smith, like a lot of historically black colleges and universities, has had financial troubles over the years and uh, 
the accreditation organization comes to town, they take a look at everything. They take a look at the health of your finances, your organization, how your academic uh, departments are run. They look at everything up and down and they make a decision about how strong is this and how likely is it to fulfill its mission. And the uh, this Southern Association for Accreditation that came in here uh, took a look at this now and they believe that the college is now on track. Um, I think in many ways it is. There's a new president there. Uh, their finances are better than they were a few years ago. Um, and that's not the case at another school in North Carolina, Bennett College, which is one of only two uh, historically black women's colleges in the U.S. And they did not get reaccredited re re this week, and they are in danger of shutting down. So uh, that, that's the situation there. The word equity, uh, and that, not, not the actors' union, but just the yeah. word equity has returned to discussions uh, surrounding CMS. School board's been debating the value of creating a citizen equity panel. School board chair Mary McCray says a new equity panel would simply add, quote, yet another failed committee to this community's hall of fame of good intentions. Hokey smokes. What, where did that come from? I think we've got very lively. This is, I, this, which you would think would be almost a perfunctory, of course we'll create a committee. And you have a majority of the school board and it's a combination of black and white, Republican and Democrat saying, no, we think a committee would be a distraction at best and essentially could serve as a substitute for actual action. They're saying, we don't need somebody else to tell us what the problems are. We know, we've known for years, we've known for decades. We've got a superintendent and his staff who are very clearly focused on that. They haven't actually done a lot yet, but they have defined the problem. Let's let them work at it. If we need to talk to people, talk to teachers, they know what's going on, talk to students, they know what's going on. Although interestingly, the student advisor who was seated earlier that evening said, actually our student group thinks we ought to have some kind of citizen panel. So you had this group saying, this is just a huge waste of time and saying it in very strong terms and very strong about how some of the past panels had been a waste of time. And then you had four board members saying, of course it's not the only thing you do. We're not talking about creating a panel and then just you know taking a vacation. We're talking about getting citizens involved in a way that builds trust, that gets a greater voice in here, that makes everybody a part of what we're trying to do. Because clearly these racial and economic gaps are not something that CMS created. They are something that is part of a much broader society that CMS is trying to deal with. Meanwhile, I mentioned Mary McCray being the school board chair. She's again the school board chair. What, what is this, the uh, seventh time or yep. seventh year? Is it the seventh year or the seventh term? Seventh year, uh, they, they re-elect re -elect every, every year. year. She's, this is her second term on the board. They do have okay. four year terms. And this will be her last uh, year as school board chair by her own election, correct? She's decided that. She going has to been quite definite that she's not going to seek another term the, and they will be up next year. The board, everybody on the board voted for her except for Erica uh, Ellis Stewart. She abstained. That's interesting. Why did she abstain? Uh, I would assume that there are some pretty big differences of opinion between her and Mary and she didn't want to or think it was practical to try to run somebody else but didn't feel like in good conscience she could vote for Mary. She did not make any kind of statement. She just kind of quietly raised her hand for abstain. And, and very quickly, uh, they found more lead in the water at three schools, uh, Providence High, Randolph Middle, Northwest School of the Arts, again in drinking fountains and again it's been remedied? Yeah, again, this is just part of their strategy, they went way too far on hiding it last time, and this time they're trying to go way out there. As every time they get a batch of results, even if it's a handful of schools, they're saying, here's what we got. It's the local news roundup on Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Yesterday, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, the pipeline that they want to build to bring natural gas through uh, the state, uh, cannot cross the Appalachian Trail. They handed down that ruling yesterday. What does that mean? for the future of the pipeline, David? Well, uh, this could be a significant roadblock. We're still waiting to hear what the company will do. Remember, this pipeline is being built by Dominion Energy of Virginia and Duke Energy and another partner. And they, they now will have to decide how they challenge this. I, they have said yesterday that they will immediately appeal this. They point to the fact that there are 56 other gas and oil pipelines that cross the Appalachian Trail, so they may have a leg to stand on there. On the other hand, uh, the court has been ruling now for the second time on environmental challenges to this, and so I think there's still a lot of litigation ahead. 
Okay. Uh, it doesn't happen here very often, and maybe you didn't even notice that it happened, but there was an earthquake this week on Wednesday in Tennessee between Chattanooga and Knoxville. Two of them, 4.4 magnitude earthquake at 4.14 a.m. Wednesday morning and a 3.3 at 4.27 a.m. It reverberated all over Tennessee and the southeast to Atlanta, into Greenville, Spartanburg, allegedly Charlotte. <laughs> Did anybody feel it? Okay, I guess nobody a lot felt. of us were not awake at 4.27 a.m. So, <laughs> you know where there my, was my an earthquake? Dog, in my, Bladen County. <laughs> <laughs> my, my dog owner friends say their dogs were up barking in the middle of the night. And last week, uh, we mentioned that the new Mecklenburg County Sheriff, Gary McFadden, had pulled the county out of participating in ICE's uh, 287G program, which caused uh, sheriff's deputies to ask inmates, are you uh, here legally? And if they said no, they turned them over to ICE and got compensation in return. Uh, he's pulled the county out of that, and now other county sheriffs are following his lead. Is that yeah. correct? In the Wake and Durham, it's, it's happening as well. This is what he ran on. He won, and it was his first act. Yeah. So. Uh, construction began this week on affordable housing partner project in West Charlotte, which could be the model for future use of the $50 million. Why? Uh, it's a model because of the large number of partners in there. A church put in $2 million. A lot of the land was donated. The rents at this will be from $350 a month up to $1,500 a month. It's David Borax from WFAE News, Ann Doss Helms from the Charlotte Observer, Nick Oxner from WBTV, and a final, you get the last word, Mary, because you have a note of passing, and we have 20 seconds, a, a note of a, of a passing of a pretty important person. A death of a very important, yes, Rosanelle Eaton at 97. Her, she was the lead plaintiff on the suit that overturned the voting law. She's a woman who when she was 21 in the 40s, had to recite the, Declar the U.S. Uh, Constitution preamble to get the right to Mary vote. Mary C. Curtis, thank you all for the hour from 7th Street Market on WFAE.